Hi, everyone. Thank you for watching the East Village Queer Film Festival presented by The Wild Project. You just finished watching our short film program, Queer Absurdism. My name is Christine Copley, and I'll be moderating the Q&A with a couple of tonight's filmmakers and creators. I'm very happy to be joined by Amelia Xanthe Boskov, director and writer of Witchy Poo. Elizabeth Mays, director, writer, and producer of The Standoff. Oriana, Oriana Opis, director and producer of Go, Go, Boy. And Ashley Burton, director, co-writer, and co-producer of Pridezilla. And Alex Holland, star, co-writer, and co-producer of Pridezilla. Um, I just want to start by asking all of you, what inspired you to make this film? I'm going to start with Amelia. Yeah, so I think the main inspiration for me was just this desire to have a queer rom-com um, that actually has a happy ending, um, just because I feel like that's something I don't actually get to see in the world yet. Um, so yeah, that was definitely my main inspiration. All right, so I think for me, I made this sort of in the midst, really sort of towards the beginning of the quarantine. And I think I was in a thing where I wanted to just create a different world that I could exist in for a little while. So um, the real world was frustrating and impossible to fix. And so it's, I kind of feel like it was like my fever dream like it just had every component I wanted to soak myself in. Like there was like a queer woman at the center. Um, her queerness is totally unquestioned and like unproblematic even in the context of the wild west. And um, nothing really that bad happens. Even the villain is not that evil. Uh, and it was kind of like me like soothing myself from the world as it was. I made it right during March. So yeah, that was my inspiration. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, so I'd read this script a long time ago, uh, probably about five or six years ago. And um, I don't know, sometimes the universe just tells you that like now is the time to act on something that you've been thinking about for a while. And, um, you know, my, my film is about a 12 year old boy who discovers that he's gay in his own bedroom. And it's a good situation. It's not running for the razors. It's, it's a moment of discovery and self acceptance. And I think as somebody who, um, you know, tried to take a girl to a dance and got turned away when she was 13 and just kind of, you know, it was the uh, mid nineties and like nobody reached out and said, hey, you're gonna be okay. I think it, it, for some reason, it just felt like the time to make a film where a kid can say, hey, I'm gay and it's okay. Um, and um, I guess, ironically, I was like, almost eight months pregnant at that point. So I think being a mother, uh, or about to become a mother um, to a boy for some reason, um, uh, really made the experience as a director on set, um, especially uh, meaningful and, and strong. Yeah, so um, our inspiration for Pridezilla, um, everyone has very deep answers. Ours was really, a joke we made, um, you know, a bad pun on Bridezilla's, you know, made in passing that was kind of like a, hey, that's funny. Hey, we should make a film about that. <laughs> oh, sh we should really make a film about that and kind of just like went with it and the, the idea kind of morphed and became its thing. And then, you know, it went from being a very um, light satirical parody thing to becoming kind of a, um, more of a heartwarming queer story as well of, you know, kind of growing up a little bit for this character in a way. Um, I think you would probably agree. Yeah, I mean, it, mm -hmm. I absolutely would agree. And it, it's just, it started on a wine fueled, let's be frank, it was a wine fueled night mm -hmm. of <laughs> us just hanging out, goofing off. Talking and about the upcoming Pride. Pride was coming up. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, 2019, slightly better times. And uh, <laughs> um, and we, you know, I, I had said, you know, um, in previous years past, you can become kind of like 
a bridezilla equivalent getting ready for pride because you want everything to be just perfect and <laughs> and uh and so that's that's how it all started yeah um how did you cast your movie um and did you have your actors in mind while you were casting um and i'm gonna start with amelia yeah that that's a really good question i think casting for me was a really hard process um basically a lot of my actors dropped out at different points at different times. So I was like constantly recasting and like researching for people. Um, but it was important to me throughout that like the story really spoke to the actors personally and that they could also get behind the film in that way. Um, but more than that too, like I just really wanted to have fun on set. And I feel like that's really important for a comedy, for a lighthearted film. Um, so I feel really lucky that I ended up with the actors that I did and, you know, that they're still friends in my life and people who I'd love to work with again and I got to find through this project. Um, how about Liz? All right, so mine was a little bit more, it was less challenging, I think, um, than Amelia's. So I, my girlfriend, plays the main character and most of the characters and we were quarantining together so there was no way for her to get away from me like she couldn't drop out she didn't she couldn't get away so and then the other character was our family's dog who also just was down for whatever as long as i had like a stick to throw for her so uh, i cast based on who was around me in quarantine that was my that was how i did it <laughs> Sure. Um, we actually wrote the story with ourselves in mind. You know, we're actors first and foremost. So yeah. it's kind of, we were kind of in a situation at the moment of being like tired of waiting for work to come around, as yeah. many actors do. And so we were like, let's just make our own work. And so we wrote it with ourselves in mind and with another friend. Um, to make up our trio but then a week before shooting that friend had to drop out oh, so then we just started reaching out to every actor we knew um to fill that large role um and we ended up getting someone who fit it better than we could have imagined he was fantastic um, yes uh, ali ali dubar he is an incredible young little angel he's so wonderful killed it um brought levels to it that we didn't expect to have. Um, and then everyone else in the film is literally just our friends, people we've worked with in the past, um, our roommates, you know, um, just kind of, it was kind of a situation um, that we've always wanted to be in. So, you know, or you hope other people will be in. So when we got the position to give our friends work, that's what we wanted to do. Um, you know, kind of, if I have a job for you, I'm going to, I'm going to give you work kind of thing. Um, and it ended up working out very, very well. Thankfully, we're very surrounded by very talented people. Mm -hmm. And I would even say, um, even though we did have ourselves in mind, obviously, when we were writing these characters, um, a challenge that we sort of faced uh, was separating ourselves from the characters as yes. we wrote it to make sure that, you know, <laughs> we didn't feel uncomfortable with this or that. So, you know, it's, exaggerating those qualities about us that we had originally envisioned in the character. No, when you're casting children, you really don't <laughs> don't have many in mind, um, which is cool because you get to pick from like a really fresh slate of, of talent. Yeah. Um, we had like 150 um, people apply from all over the country. I, I was amazed, like people flew in from Denver and were, you know, were in wow. Denver, or drew it or uh, drove in from Michigan and Indiana and Ohio. It was, it was crazy. Um, but, you know, I think with children, you have to be very flexible in terms of what you're casting for. So, you know, originally, um, ethnicity was out the window. Like I didn't care. Um, as long as I found the right person didn't matter. Um, and you know, filmmakers, I don't think the world at large knows this, but filmmakers know, know that generally your casting is pretty specific. It'll say the ethnicity, the age, um, you know, the body build and, uh, you know, here in a situation like this, we just didn't have that. So wide open. And really what we were looking for was some dance talent, right? We had to, 
work with somebody who had worked with a choreographer and understood that rehearsals were going to be necessary. Um, somebody who just kind of, I didn't necessarily want trained actors, especially trained child actors can be very um, cookie cutter. So I, I didn't really care about that so much as he could take direction from me, which you know you do through a series of callbacks. And then frankly, it's just that feeling. It's just that feeling of like, oh my God, this person is ready to show me who he is. Mm -hmm. And in this case, you know, I, you can't ask a 12 year old boy like, hey, are you gay? Do you know what this is like, this experience? You can't do that. Yeah. Uh, you can't really do that in, with anybody, adults either, but especially with children, it's a very sensitive thing. And, you know, you just have to trust that what you're seeing in front of you is what's going to come out in the, in the story. And as it turns out, you know, um, this, this Marcus, this, this gem of a, a person kind of like, uh, I don't want to say like came out because it's such a specific thing, but he really discovered a part of himself while we were filming that, oh. he, is, that he has now grown into. So again, like, it's just that feeling of like, this is the most genuine, you know, when you talk about like child, childhood innocence, and especially when you're talking about a child coming out, like the innocence factor is just like through the roof. We're watching somebody bloom. Um, just being able to cast Marcus in that in that role was a phenomenal feeling. That's great. I felt like that boy. <laughs> I was that boy. <laughs> That's not a lot. Like everyone knows that feeling of being that little queer kid. And um, yeah. you know, it's, it's it's just so great to, to feel the audience connect with someone like him. Yeah. Next question. I noticed that all of you were um, really inspired, or some of you at least, um, were inspired by certain time periods. Yeah, I would, um, you know, ours does take place in modern day, but um, one of our locations is an arcade, um, which isn't really somewhere that people hang out in the modern times um but i was really trying to think of a location that would add to um the characters that hang out there because i had this group of like straight guys that you know that's very hard for me to relate to so i was trying to find a world they could exist in that would add something to who they are and our kids are great because not only does it say something strange about these guys but it also gave them a physical activity, which is always nice um, for acting um, and directing. Um, but yeah, in general, I just feel like I was really inspired by 80s rom-coms for the vibe in general, um, because I love those kinds of films. And I feel like they really capture kind of absurdist vibe to romance. And I think I, I really tried to lean into that for sure. So for me, I had been uh, I had been living in DC for years, and then I had been more recently living in um, Vietnam and traveling. And then this pandemic sort of landed me back in my hometown where I'm from in rural Oregon. And I was kind of like vibing out on being in the West. I was like, something about it was, um, I was finding it just to be very appealing. I wanted to just immerse myself in the whole feeling of the West. I was watching, um, Right before I made this film, I was watching Charlie Chaplin's Gold Rush, which is this like old silent Western. And um, and then I remembered, oh, there's this ghost town near my near my home. And I don't know, I think it just all came together. I was just kind of vibing on the West Coast. I'd been away from home for so long and I just wanted to make a film about the West. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think uh, Pridezilla is pretty modern uh it's pretty much like no ifs ands or buts about it very <laughs> 2020 uh well, it, <laughs> 2019 very when it was 2019 filmed. we had we actually had a hard time of like having to crop say, out some jokes that we were like this won't age we have to take yeah. that out <laughs> this just happened this week you can't you can't say that because it won't stay it won't be timeless but i will say that um, a lot of the references, like the um, getting ready montage and a lot of the kinds of reality shows and stuff that we referenced when we were writing it, um, definitely like a, an early 2000s, mm -hmm. like totally. all those awful reality shows on MTV. It's very much like that vibe. And then 
um, you know, the makeover montages from 80s and 90s movies as well. So there's definitely like little bits and pieces pulled. We watched a lot of uh, Jersey Shore and, um, Bri and, and Bridezilla's, uh, Bridezilla to kind of get some inspiration. Yeah, definitely too much. <laughs> the movie set in 1989. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> very specific about that. Yeah. Um, when I was choosing, um, you know, all the wrestlers to go like in the background of his room. Like, yes. Romney, I had to purchase 1989 wrestler magazines. Like everything was very specific. Um, I chose that time because I, I grew up in the 80s and early 90s. And I remember WWF just being like everywhere. Yeah. And everybody, like even girls were kind of obsessed with these like action figures and just watching all of Hogan and all this stuff. And so when, when I think of like, the quintessential cheesy, greasy, muscly man. <laughs> I think of like 80s wrestlers. Um, and then the other thing that um, I think is uh, kind of crazy when you think about it is back then there was no social media. So the pressure of a 12, 13 year old coming out was still huge. And now can you imagine today what that feels like with social media? Like it's, it, I just wanted to give the audience a different perspective that yeah. some people will remember, but some people don't. Some people don't remember a world without social media. <laughs> yeah. um, so I just wanted to um, place that context around the story to give it a, a different feel. Um, how did you pick your um, background music? What inspired you with that? And I know it kind of goes with sort of the concept and the time period, but um, I'm gonna start with Amelia. So my um, music was composed for the film. So oh. there wasn't so much like picking involved, I guess, but I um, worked with a composer and I, I, I didn't give um, her a lot of direction, but I had kind of this specific um idea of you know i wanted it to be spooky and you know have like witchy overtones but i also really wanted there to be pop music you know i really wanted it to have kind of that 80s vibe again um and then i also have a big montage scene and so i was like i want something with lyrics there too and you know almost like we have like a hit single pop song that's like in our film um so i worked with a composer to make that happen and we got something that I think is really unique and gay and fun and just um, adds back into the spooky 80s feel of the film. Awesome. And um, Liz? Yeah, for me, I tried to find, well, obviously I was looking for open source music that I could use that like wouldn't have a copyright on it. And I was able to find some really old tracks, like early 1900s, um, like sort of kind of almost classical vibes. Um, and I liked that, like that appealed to me a lot, just knowing even if other people don't know that it has this like actually very old music. Like, I think I downloaded one from like a Library of Congress archive. Um, so for me, it added like a texture to the film that maybe is not known by everyone, but yeah, that's how I chose it. it. Was just mainly open source, but then also finding really old music that wouldn't have a copyright. Yeah, I liked. I liked. I mean, it it like totally lended to like the whole country western, and you know, it was good. Um, Oriana. So you know, for the opening credits, we had really macho 80s music um, and a couple other references in there that were really time specific. But the big fantasy sequence is the Romeo and Juliet love suite from Tchaikovsky. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those things, you know, when you're a filmmaker and something just pops in your head and you're like, oh, it's just gotta be that. It's gotta be that. And you don't even have a reason why, but it's just gotta be. So I knew it was gonna be that. Um, and then when I thought about it, I realized, you know, this is, this is the love theme from that piece. And I think Bobby's first love is himself. And I think that's, a, for a child who's, who's gay, like, I think that's the way it should be. You know, you should be able to feel that for yourself first. And then, you know, um, Tchaikovsky was gay and um, really yeah. suffered with that. So I think, you know, in, in sort of like that, you know, meta way, it just kind of lends to that struggle between like wanting to join this world, but not fully being able to. And so, you know, again, we get to that theme of like, 
what can we do to make that easier for people, easier for, for kids? And Ashley? Yeah, um, our journey to finding our music was kind of similar and also the exact opposite to Liz's. Um, ours was we were looking for whatever was free, open source. We wanted to find, you know, something that, but things that felt new, things that felt like you could, you would hear them on the radio, things that would be, you know, um, because most of ours were, it was transitional music. We didn't have a lot of um, underscoring. Um, and so we just looked for a lot of things that felt very clubby, felt very party vibe that you would hear. We even like, when we watched all this Bridezilla, Jersey Shore, Real World, all those like episodic reality shows, we were listening to what those sounded like. And it's not a whole lot of, um, like radio hits, but kind of beats that would sound like they are. Mm -hmm. um, so we went for a lot of those. And um, I think that the final song was one that we agonized over because we couldn't find the right song until we found it. And then we're like, no, that's it. That's it. it kind of like what Oriana was saying, it, that that's it. You know, it makes the decision makes itself. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, I think definitely for like you were saying for the transitional scenes, um, but as, well, aside from the transitional scenes, rather, uh, there were like key moments like the the makeover montage and then that goes into like this strut. And originally, like we had envisioned like the makeover from Mean Girls, like that music, just like, so it, it was a big part of like, could you see Regina George from Mean Girls walking to this music, <laughs> you know? Uh, and then like with the Jersey Shores, it's like, can you fist bump to this music? <laughs> and then, yeah. but make that modern. Yeah. So definitely, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, mm -hmm. the, that ending song, it had to be the perfect balance of like uplifting, but also still like, I think a little- A little after school special, I think is one of the things we were kind of going oh, for. Oh yeah. That, it has that, that um, wrap up and the moral of the story that, you know, the sit down moment kind of- Do you have any new projects in the works and where can everyone follow you on social media to stay in touch with your work? Amelia. Um, yes, so I'm currently working on a web series with my roommate that's rather quarantine inspired, but is also absurdist and fun. And, you know, we're two queer women making it. Um, and I guess the best place to find updates on that um, would be on my Instagram, which is Amelia Xanthi, my name. So yeah, you can check that out. And Liz? Okay, so yeah, I'm working on sort of a psychological thriller vibe that deals with kind of a dystopian world having to do with COVID. Um, and you can find me, it's Lizzie Mays, at Lizzie Mays, and it's IE, Lizzie IE Mays on Instagram. Okay. And Oriana? Um, yeah, so I was I was in pre-production for a feature and in development for a feature um, until COVID hit. Um, everything kind of stopped, except for the one that was in development now is in pre-production. So kind of the behind the scenes stuff we were able to continue. Um, as everyone knows, filming is very difficult right now. So we just have to wait until things kind of uh, normalize or people figure out how to let actors talk, you know, three inches away from each other without worrying about getting infected. Yeah. Um, so, um, but yeah, they're, they're, uh, very female centric projects. Um, one is, uh, sort of a, uh, dark comedy about, um, a woman whose mother dies and all sorts of fun things happen there. And then another one is uh, straight comedy, which is about a senior citizen dance troupe. So, if you oh. want ballerinas in their 70s, this is the one for you. Oh. <laughs> um, and you can follow me. I'm just at Oriana Opus on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. And then my website is just orianaopus.com. And you can find a lot of my other films and other commercials that I've directed there as well. Okay. And were you ever a dancer? No. Oh. <laughs> I don't know why the dance keeps like. Oh, it just keeps coming to you? <laughs> I'm not a dancer. 
<laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, and Ashley. Yeah. Um, oh, so we've actually been toying around with the idea of turning Pridezilla into a series um, just because we, we really enjoyed the response that we've had to it so far. And pretty much unanimously, the reaction has been, when can we see more of these characters? Like we want to see them do more stuff. And so we've toyed around with the idea of using the Pridezilla film as a pilot of sorts and to build off that or, you know, so that's still a possibility. Or maybe some random spinoff. Yeah. Um, so those are the things that are kind of in the works. Um, oh, and you can you can keep up uh, in touch with us on up to date um, on Instagram at mm -hmm. Pridezilla Film. You can find both of our personals on there, there as well. Yeah, at Pridezilla Film. Um, and then I'm just an I'm also usually an actor. This was our first film, you know. That we did this much work for but I, you know i um i'm actually in a play in the village um it's the only theater happening in new york city right now i i think um but it's called voyeur uh it's a walking tour of the village outdoor safe pandemic friendly fully masked small audience um dance installations art puppets shadow puppets you oh. name it, it's it's gorgeous, it's sad, it's sexy, and um, it's really, really lovely, and I've really enjoyed being a part of it, and you can check it out at um, Unmaking Lautrec Play, because it is about Henri de Toulouse Lautrec, so unmakingleautrecplay.com. Awesome, and Alex, are you an actor? I am an actor as well, yeah. I'm not working on anything at the moment. Um, <laughs> I mean, I just started a makeup Instagram. Does that count? <laughs> uh, it's at, I guess I do makeup now, if you guys want to check it out. Um, but otherwise, yeah, just waiting for this pandemic to be over. Me too. <laughs> well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, I'm gonna, that will wrap up tonight's Q&A. And thanks again to the filmmakers and thank you for watching. You can catch the rest of the festival, which continues through this Sunday, October 11th, by visiting our website at thewildproject.org. Thank you very much.